This lecture is about phase transitions. As you know, matter can take a very wide variety of different forms, even with the same chemical composition. An example, H2O. Water can be liquid, the stuff that flows, the stuff that you drink, or it can, if you cool it down enough, it can become ice or take a different form, snow, and every snowflake is different. Now, each phase of a substance is characterized by some quantity which is different. So it could be density, it could be specific heat, or in some cases it could be magnetism, so forth. A lot of materials, eventually when they cool down enough, they become crystals, and that's the crystalline phase. And in the crystalline phase, the properties of that substance are very different from that in, the, in another phase, let's say the liquid phase or the gaseous phase. There are countless examples of phase transitions. One very interesting one, and we won't be able to deal with it in this lecture, is the phase transition which happened in the early universe when it was made up of quarks and gluons and electrons and photons floating around. When that universe expanded sufficiently, the temperature dropped, the quarks and the gluons were able to undergo a phase transition and become neutrons and protons. And that was the beginning of the making of atoms. And of course, the rest is history. It's a vast subject, but let's begin with something simple. Phase transitions happen in countless situations. Let's take some common examples. Here is the melting of a solid. So imagine that you're giving energy to some solid in the form of heat. As you give it more and more energy, the temperature goes up, but then it stops rising over here. And the temperature then remains constant until all the solid is melted. Once it's melted and has become liquid, as you provide it more energy, again its temperature keeps rising and rising until you reach the point where that liquid starts to vaporize. First, a little bit of the liquid vaporizes, and then ultimately when you reach here, all the liquid has vaporized, and become gas. Now the temperature of the gas will start rising, but earlier that liquid had existed with the gas and the temperature had remained absolutely constant. Now here the solid had first become liquid and then that liquid had become gas. It's also possible that a solid directly become a gas. This is called the process of sublimation. So, for example, carbon dioxide, when it is cold, very, very cold, becomes a solid. But as soon as you heat it, it doesn't become a liquid at ordinary pressures. It goes directly from solid to gas. More generally, here's how things can happen. So, here's a solid. You give it more and more energy in the form of heat. It starts to melt. And as it melts, of course, the temperature remains constant until all of it is as melted, become liquid. You give it more heat, it vaporizes. And, of course, the temperature doesn't change until all the liquid has been changed into gas. Now, if you give this gas more and more energy so that the atoms and molecules inside this gas start moving around faster and faster, then they will be colliding with each other more and more. And if they collide hard enough, then that gas will eventually ionize and you'll get a plasma out of it. So when the atoms and molecules collided with each other hard enough, the electrons got knocked off, maybe some electrons or maybe all electrons. That depends upon how much heat you have provided. So in fact, this gas has ionized, it's become plasma. This plasma has got positive and negative charges moving around freely inside it. In fact, this is what you see quite frequently inside fluorescent tubes. And this is precisely what happens in the Earth's ionosphere. 
Now imagine that you were to cool this plasma down, then you would have deionization. The positive charges or the atomic nuclei would capture the electrons. They would then form atoms, neutral atoms, that make up this gas. And if you start cooling down this gas, then eventually this gas will condense, become liquid. And if you cool this further and further, this liquid will freeze and eventually become a solid. Of course, then when you cool this solid down further, nothing much happens. It remains a solid. Now what I had referred to earlier over here, that is sublimation, is also seen over here. So solid goes directly to a gas. It can also happen that you can have equilibrium with the solid, liquid and gas all at one temperature and pressure. That is called the triple point. We'll come to that later. Now this situation was for normal kinds of matter. So this solid could be ice or sulfur or iron or whatever. There are other examples of phase transitions that involve very kinds of strange behavior. This is a normal metal. It could be copper, zinc, iron, lead, gold, silver. As you cool it down, so let's follow it as the temperature goes from normal temperatures down to zero degrees Kelvin. For a normal metal, the resistance simply keeps going down very smoothly. This is because the electrons that move in that wire carrying the current get hit less and less frequently because the atoms inside a normal metal vibrate less and less as you start cooling the wire down. However, a superconductor is very, very different. So as you cool the superconductor down, it behaves more or less normally until you reach a critical temperature, at which point the resistance totally disappears. This becomes a perfect conductor with zero resistance, exactly zero resistance. Now, there is over here at this point a phase transition. It has made a transition from a normal conductor to a superconductor at this particular critical temperature, Tc. Even stranger kinds of phase transitions have been measured in some materials, particularly liquid helium. Liquid helium becomes a superfluid. But let's start from some point over here. So if we increase the temperature, then liquid helium eventually, eventually means just a little above 5 degrees Kelvin, turns into a gas. And gas is how, of course, we know helium to be. However, if you cool it down, then it becomes a liquid, roughly over here, at normal pressures. However, if you start cooling it down further and further, then the character of that liquid changes. It completely loses its viscosity. In other words, it will flow through a narrow pipe as though it had no friction at all, no viscosity. And just like over here, it's exactly zero resistance. Here, it is zero viscosity. At higher pressures, it's a different matter. So, suppose we look at one degree Kelvin, and as we increase the pressure on the superfluid from 10 atmospheres or 10 bars to 20 to about 25, what happens is that the superfluid becomes a solid. Suppose we start heating this solid. Well, then that solid will eventually become a liquid. But the interesting transition is over here, and a lot of work has been done to understand this. When does a liquid go from a normal liquid and become a superfluid? This is purely a quantum mechanical effect, and I'll say no more about this.
Let's take an everyday example of a phase transition, the melting of ice. I'll work out this example. The latent heat of ice at 0 degrees centigrade and 1 atmosphere pressure is 1.4363 kilocalories per mole. The latent heat of ice is the amount of heat that the environment must provide to the ice to break the bonds that hold the water molecules together. And so this process will take place when you, or rather the environment, provides the energy. Now at zero degrees centigrade and one atmosphere pressure, the density of ice is 0.917 grams per cc, whereas the density of water is higher. It is 0.9998 grams per cc. Now this means that ice will float on water because it is less dense. Water is very unusual in this regard. Now suppose that one mole of ice melts, and here is the conversion of atmospheric pressure to newtons per meter squared. I like to use these units, the meter kilogram second units, MKS. Now let's address the following question. Find the work done by the system. Whenever a system expands, it does work. That amount of work is given by the pressure, provided that remains constant, times the change in volume. Here the change in volume is the final volume, which is that of water, minus the initial volume, which is the volume of ice. The volume of ice is the mass of ice, and that's 18 grams for one mole, 18 because oxygen is 16, and the two hydrogens are one each, so 16 plus 2 is 18, and we divide by the density of ice. This is the volume of water. We take their difference, so we put here the pressure in newtons per meter squared, and that's the change in the volume. That then is to be expressed in meters cubed, which means that this meter cubed will cancel with this meter squared to give newton meters, which is a joule, a joule of energy. And so there is negative work which the system does. Or you could say that the atmosphere has done work equal to this much upon the system of ice and water. Next, we are asked to find the change in the internal energy of the system. That change, delta U, is equal to the final internal energy minus the initial internal energy. And here is the conversion. One calorie is so many joules. Well, the change in the internal energy is equal to the amount of heat that has been put into the system minus the work that has been done by the system. The amount of work that has been put into the system is just the latent heat, which is given above, over here, and PdV, as we've just calculated, that is to say this W, this W is PdV, that is equal to, now, we just do a bit of calculation. This is the latent heat expressed in calories, and now we convert that to joules, and then add on PdV. So that was negative, and so two negatives make a positive. You notice over here that this amount, that is to say the work done by the system, is very, very small in magnitude as compared to the latent heat. And so the total change in the internal energy is equal to this, 6,100 joules. Finally, let's find the change in the entropy. So the change in entropy is the final entropy minus the initial entropy. We expect this to be positive because, after all, the water is more disordered than the ice. This is trivially calculated. The change in the entropy is the amount of heat which is put into the ice, and that's the latent heat of ice, divided by the melting temperature of ice, 
which is 0 degrees centigrade, that is 273 degrees K, Kelvin. Well, let's just put in the latent heat, which is this, work out the result, and that's 22 joules per K. Again, this entropy is a positive number because, as you can see over here, there was a more ordered state. That ordered state became a relatively more disordered state, that of water, as a result of the bonds in the ice breaking. In thermodynamics, there's a very important theorem which is due to Leonard Euler some 200 years ago, and this then will allow us to introduce the concept of molar quantities as well. So let's start from a system which is at constant pressure and temperature and has a number of particles or number of moles equal to N. This system is embedded in a reservoir and that reservoir maintains a constant pressure and a constant temperature and there is no flow of particles into or out of the reservoir. So we have these three fixed numbers, P, T, N. Now imagine an identical system, which is at the same pressure and temperature, but which has twice the number of particles, twice the number of moles. This system here has some internal energy, entropy, enthalpy, and Gibbs free energy. This system, which is twice as big, will have twice the internal energy, twice the entropy, twice the enthalpy, twice the Gibbs free energy. Now suppose that this system was not twice as big, but lambda times bigger. So all of these quantities, and I will write over here just G, although the same holds for U, S, H as well, so this G now has got lambda times the number of moles initially, and the Gibbs free energy is lambda times bigger than the system which is over here. So we have this expression which holds for every extensive quantity. This lambda over here could be 2, it could be 20, or it could be just 1.00001, anything. The Gibbs free energy scales in this way. Now suppose I take lambda equal to 1 plus a very, very small number, which I'm going to call epsilon, then this equation here leads directly to this. That is to say, instead of lambda n, I have n plus epsilon n, and that is equal to lambda times g, so that's lambda times g. Well, this is perfect for doing an expansion. Let's do that. So to first order, g of p t n plus epsilon is equal to g plus epsilon n into dg by dn. And of course, over here, I have neglected terms of order epsilon squared. On the right-hand side, I have simply 1 plus epsilon times g, which is g plus epsilon g. So this g and this g cancel, so do the epsilons. And provided epsilon is small, it doesn't matter what the value of epsilon is. From here, we get this important result that g over n is equal to partial g by partial n. This partial derivative over here means that p and t have been kept fixed. This dg by dn is what we call the chemical potential. So the chemical potential is how much the Gibbs free energy changes when you change the number of moles. Of course, here I've taken the Gibbs free energy, but exactly the same principle applies to all extensive quantities. That is to say, as we add more particles to the system, u, s, v, h, a, they all increase linearly with the number of moles or the number of particles. Let me remind you of the full expression for G, which is the enthalpy minus Ts. And now, because we are allowing the number of particles to change, then 
this is the additional term. And earlier we had derived this formula as well, that the change in g is equal to vdp minus sdt plus mu dn. This obviously means that v is equal to partial g by partial p, keeping t and n constant. So just put these equal to zero, and that this is what v then becomes. Minus s then becomes dg by dt. And mu, of course, is what we have above, dg by dn at constant p and t. I'll now define these tilde quantities. So this little squiggle over here is s tilde, which is defined to be the entropy of the system divided by the number of moles. Similarly, v tilde is the volume of the system divided by the number of moles, and this holds also for the enthalpy and for the Gibbs free energy. These definitions will come in very useful for what we are going to do. These are called molar quantities. That is to say, entropy per mole, Gibbs free energy per mole, etc., etc. These molar quantities can be experimentally measured. Now here, it is assumed that a molar quantity does not depend upon the number of moles. So if the Gibbs free energy has a certain value for two moles of a substance, then for six moles of that same substance, it should have three times as much value. Well, it certainly follows from our assumption, our scaling assumption over here, but when is scaling to be believed? When is it correct? The answer is, as long as the system is big enough. Big enough means that all constituents do not interact with each other, they only interact with the ones around them. And so there is an inherent assumption over here that the force between the constituents, the atoms, molecules, or whatever, is sufficiently short range. Euler's theorem is going to be useful in understanding a basic equation describing phase transitions called the clausius clapeyron equation. And I'm going to derive this for you using the Euler theorem. Imagine a system which is at constant pressure. There's a liquid and the vapor of that liquid, they are in equilibrium with each other. The pressure is constant, so is the temperature. We will call the Gibbs free energy for the liquid GL. And that's a function of the pressure, the temperature, and the number of moles of liquid that are present here. Similarly, the Gibbs free energy for the vapor is also a function of the pressure, temperature, and the number of moles of the vapor. Now imagine that we heat this liquid, supply some heat to it. Well, we know that the liquid will absorb that heat, the bonds will break, and there will be more vapor. Of course, the total number of atoms or molecules is not going to change. Whatever goes out from the liquid goes into the vapor. Now I'm going to write this n in the following way. The number of atoms that have been lost by the liquid that's delta N. So now the remaining number in the liquid is NL minus delta N. The vapor has gained delta N, so I'm going to write that. And this happens after I've heated it. Let's now recall how any extensive function scales. So an extensive function of lambda N will be simply lambda times F of N, which means that you can write f of n minus delta n in the following way, and then you can write this as 1 minus delta n over n times f of n. This, of course, comes from here. Now let's see what this implies for the Gibbs free function. The liquid, Gl, will go into Gl minus delta n over n, GL will change and GV will change and each of these will be multiplied by this factor over here 
So the total Gibbs free energy will change by this amount over here, which, of course, you can write as gt minus delta n into these molar quantities here. So gl tilde is just gl divided by nl, and gv tilde is gv over nv. Now the condition for equilibrium is that the chemical potentials be equal or equivalently that the Gibbs free energy per mole be equal in the liquid and in the vapor state. This follows from the principle that the Gibbs free energy is always minimized, which means that the first order change will always be equal to zero. So GL tilde must be equal to GV tilde, and that's what we have over here. And so at equilibrium, these two quantities are equal, and I remind you that GL tilde and GV tilde are both functions of pressure and temperature. This obviously means that if there's a small change in pressure and a small change in temperature, then DGL tilde is equal to this, which now involves molar quantities. So here is the molar volume, and here is the molar entropy. Exactly the same is true for the vapor phase, where here we have the volume per mole of the vapor and the entropy per mole of the vapor. Now let's equate this with that. We have the following equation. So this over here is the coefficient of dp, and this is the coefficient of dt. Let's write this in the following way. dp by dt is then the change in the molar entropy divided by the change in the molar volume. And so that can be written as follows. dp by dt is equal to delta s tilde divided by delta v tilde. And that is the famous clausius clapeyron equation. Applied to this liquid vapor system is telling you that the vapor pressure changes as a function of temperature in the following way. For the liquid vapor system, there are some important simplifications. So here the change in the molar entropy is simply the latent heat of vaporization divided by the temperature at which that happens. So that's L divided by T. Now, a gas occupies more volume than the liquid, and so we can make the approximation that the molar volume of the vapor is much bigger than the molar volume of the liquid. This will allow us to neglect this term over here. We can also make the simplification that the vapor, which is over here, is an ideal gas. So then we use the ideal gas equation, the pressure into the volume is equal to nRT. When you divide the volume by n, you get the molar volume of the vapor, which is then RT divided by P. Let's put that into the clausius clapeyron equation. We get dP by dT is then LP over RT squared. That's because delta S tilde is L over T, so L, and there's one T over there. And, of course, the change in the volume is now RT over P, and so we get dP by dT equals to this, which you can write as dP over P equals this, and now this is easy to integrate. If I integrate this side, I'll get log of P, and here I will get 1 over t with a minus sign, and so log of p becomes minus L over r into 1 over t with a minus sign, plus some integration constant, which is then easily solved, and here is our final result that the pressure, the vapor pressure, is then e to the minus the latent heat divided by the gas constant r into the temperature at which the liquid turns into the vapor. It's a very useful and incredibly simple result.
Let's see what the Clausius-Clapeyron equation has to say about phase diagrams. So here is pressure on this axis, temperature on this axis. The Clausius-Clapeyron equation says dP by dt is equal to the change in the molar entropy divided by the change in the molar volume. And this will give us the slope at any value of pressure and temperature. So let's say that we are over here. In fact, we've already done this earlier. There is liquid above, gas below, and the clausius clapeyron equation tells you that if you are at this point here, then the slope of this line, which is dp by dt, is then given by this quantity here on the right-hand side. Although we derive this equation for a liquid gas transition, but exactly the same equation holds for solid to liquid. So here you have melting, freezing, but you could also have sublimation and deposition. So this equation is actually a very, very useful one, although you might have to use different approximations in solving this, but it cannot be used at what is called the triple point. At this triple point, the solid, gas, and liquid are all coexisting. So this is that unique point where the chemical potential of the solid, gas, and liquid are all equal. The system is in equilibrium with all chemical potentials equal to each other. Here is the phase diagram of an actual physical system, that of carbon dioxide. At normal temperatures, that is to say around zero and in this range, carbon dioxide is a gas, it's a vapor. However, if you cool it down enough and there's sufficient pressure, then it becomes a solid and there is a direct solid to vapor transition, that's sublimation. There's a triple point here as you go on this line here, you have a liquid which can be formed at sufficiently high pressures. And then you can also have a liquid to solid transition. Whether carbon dioxide ever becomes liquid depends upon the pressure. So if we are to the left of this point, that is to say at low enough temperatures and high enough pressures, then carbon dioxide can be solid, but it cannot be liquid. It can be liquid only in this area over here. For carbon dioxide, there's another critical point over here, after which if you increase the temperature further or you increase the pressure further, it goes into a supercritical state. Phase diagrams can be very, very complicated, and to understand them from a microscopic point of view is something that is so far not possible for most substances. However, experimentally, phase changes can be quite readily determined. Finally, let me talk briefly about what are called first-order and second-order phase transitions. Let's suppose that on this axis we plot the molar volume, V, and on this axis is the temperature. Now, as we increase the temperature and reach the transition point, then suddenly there is a change in the molar volume, which is called over here dV. So there is a discontinuity over here in the volume. Imagine that you're heating a liquid. As the liquid reaches the transition temperature, there is a sudden increase in the molar volume. There's a discontinuity over here. And then as you keep increasing the temperature, the volume keeps increasing. The same can be said about the entropy. The entropy is also discontinuous. The molar entropy has some value as you increase the temperature towards the transition temperature and then there is a discontinuity called here delta S after which it increases linearly again. Of course, in equilibrium, the chemical potential is continuous. So the chemical potential would decrease 
and then decrease again after the transition temperature. However, there is no discontinuity over here. Of course, there's a discontinuity in the slope. This is sloped less negatively. This is sloped more negatively. To summarize this, molar quantities become discontinuous. There is a jump when you reach the transition temperature, such as over here or over here, but the chemical potentials are continuous. On the other hand, for a second order transition, there is no discontinuity in the molar volume or the molar entropy or the molar Gibbs free energy. It is continuous. However, the slope here and the slope here are not equal. The same goes for the entropy or for the Gibbs free energy. The chemical potential does not show any discontinuity. It is perfectly continuous in this region over here. However, if you were to look at the second order derivative, that would be discontinuous. If you look above, the derivative of mu here and the derivative of mu here are different. And so there's a discontinuity in the first derivatives of mu. Here, there is no discontinuity in the first derivatives of mu, but there is a discontinuity in the second derivative of mu. Do third order phase transitions occur? Probably, but they are so hard to measure and so hard to calculate that I don't think people have spent much time or energy on discussing them.